Good morning. God said that if two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there also. So amen for that. So the scripture reading today in God's word is Acts 2, 42 to 47. <clears throat> they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to follow fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders, signs performed by the apostles. All believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property, possessions, to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in the homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So be it. Now is it on? Oh, we're good. Okay. All right. As you all know, like I said, you all know me. I know all you. And I still get nervous when I get up here. I don't know why, but just what, I, what happens. Um, I'm not a preacher. I enjoy being up here speaking. But I don't have the, the um, qualifications, I guess you would call it, to be able to pull things right off the top of my head. So I have to pretty much read what I want to say. So I'm going to leave the meat of Acts to Alan because he'll be back next week and then gone again and back again so he can finish up Acts for us. <clears throat> what I thought I would do would, and, and again this comes out of my little study Bible that I get my information, and um, we're actually going to talk about some of the people in Acts. Um, the guys that of course, there's women there, too, but for some reason in the Older Testament and the New Testament, too, the guys take the forefront of the, of the, of the stories, and that's okay. The guys are the, the men. So anyway, let's get started. I'm going to start out with the establishment of the church. The era of the church begins where the story of Jesus' life left off. Reporting the life-changing events of Jesus' resurrection in his followers and the world. Beginning in Jerusalem, the church is established and grows rapidly, but faces increasing scrutiny by the religious leaders. The gift of the Holy Spirit empowers Peter and the other apostles to preach boldly about Jesus and to perform mighty miracles through his power. Things come to a head when a young believer named Stephen is stoned to death for his testimony, testimony before the Jewish council. And I will talk about Stephen a little bit later. And some of this is going to be a little repetitious because it's all in the same, same book and the, they were pretty much all involved in everything together. But we're going to do them individually. And we're going to start with Luke. And, um, just, and Alan has said this before too, is X is a sequel to Luke. And some information I saw said that since X uh, ended so abruptly, People wonder that maybe he was going to, uh, to uh, write another story, but never got it done. Anyway, although we know few facts about his life, Luke has left us a strong impression of himself by what he wrote. In his gospel, he emphasizes Jesus Christ's compassion. He vividly recorded both the power and demonstrated, both the power demonstrated by Christ's life and the care with which Christ treated people. 
Luke highlighted the relationships with Jesus with women. In his writings of Acts, he is full of sharp ver verbal pictures of real people caught up in the greatest events of history. Luke was also a doctor. He had a traveling medical practice as Paul's companion. Since gospel was of often welcomed with whips and stones, the doctor was und undoubtedly seldom without patients. It is even possible that Paul's thorn in the flesh was some kind of physical ailment that needed Luke's regular attention. Um, I looked up 2 Corinthians 12, th 6 through 7, and it says what Paul's thorn in his side was. It says, even, even if I should choose to boast, I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say, or because of these surprising or because of these surprising revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in the flesh in my side, a message of Satan to torment me. God also made special use of Luke as the historian of the early church. Repeatedly, the details of Luke's depression, descriptions, I'm sorry, have been proven accurate. The first word in his gospel indicate his true interest in the truth. Luke's compassion reflected the Lord's. Luke's skill as a doctor helped Paul. His passion for facts as he recorded the life of Christ, the spread of the early church, and the lives of Christianity's first missionaries gives us dependable sources for the basis of our faith. He accomplished all this by staying out of the spotlight. Perhaps his greatest example is the challenge to greatness, even when he was not the center of attention. Now we're going to go on to Stephen. Around the world, the gospel has often taken root in places prepared by the blood of martyrs. But before people can give their lives for the gospel, they must first live their lives for the gospel. One way God trains his servants is to present them with opportunities for service. Their desire to serve Christ is translated into the reality of serving others. Long before violent persecution broke out against Christians, there was already so social strife. The believers depended on each other for support. The sharing of homes, food, and resources was both a practical and necessary mark of the early church, but this didn't proceed perfectly at first. People were being overlooked. There were complaints. Imagine that. Those selected to manage were chosen for their integrity, wisdom, and sensitivity to God. Stephen was named one of the managers of food distri distribution in the early church. And besides being a good administrator, Stephen was also a powerful speaker. This is clear from the defense he made before the Jewish High Council. He presented a summary of the Jews' own history and made powerful applications that stung his listeners. During his defense, Stephen must have known that he was speaking his own death sentence. Member, members of the council, council could not stand to have their evil motives, motives exposed. They stoned him to death while he prayed for their forgiveness. His final words show, much like Jesus had, show how much like Jesus he had become in just a short time. And in Acts 7, 59 through 60, it says, as they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. And with that, he died. His death had a lasting impact on young Paul of Taurus, who would move from being a violent persecutor of Christians to being one of the greatest champions of the gospel the church has known. Stephen's life is a continual challenge to all Christians. Because he was the first to die for the faith, his sacrifice raises questions. How many risks do we take in being Jesus's, how many risks do we take in being Jesus's followers? Would we be willing to die for him? Are we really willing to live for him? And then it goes on for the, to the expansion of the church. After Steve, Stephen's martyrdom, intense persecution against those who believed in Jesus caused them to flee the city and go all over the regions of Judea and Samaria. But the Holy Spirit was still acting among these faithful people, and they continued to spread the good news about Jesus wherever they went. 
And so this persecu persecution in Jerusalem caused the church to grow even more, with new people learning about and following Jesus every day. The gospel spread to the half-Jewish population of Samaria, and God sent Peter to preach even to the Gentiles. This good news was for everyone, Jew and Gentile alike. Even the former persecutor of the church, Saul, had a life-changing experience with Jesus. And next up is Philip. Jesus' last words to his followers were a command to take the gospel everywhere, but it took intense persecution to scatter the believer, believers from Jerusalem and into Judea and Samaria, where Jesus had instructed them to go. Philip, one of the men in charge of food distribution, left Jerusalem and, like most Jewish Christians, spread the gospel wherever he went. But unlike most of them, he did not limit his audience to other Jews. He went directly to Samaria, the last place many Jews would go due to an old prejudice. The Samaritans responded in large numbers. Then word got back to Jerusalem. Peter and John were sent to evalu evaluate Philip's ministry. They quickly involved themselves, seeing firsthand God's acceptance of those who previously were considered unacceptable. In the middle of all this success and excitement, God directed Philip out into the desert for an unlikely appointment with an Ethiopian Enich, Enich? Yep, whatever that is. <laughs> Another foreigner who had been in Jerusalem. Philip went immediately. His effectiveness in sharing the gospel with this man placed a Christian <clears throat> in a significant position in a distant country. I gotta get some water. <coughs> I just remember to bring some up with me. <laughs> just a second. Sorry about that. Old gray mare, she ain't what she used to be. <laughs> ah, much better. Um, let's see. They quickly involved themselves, seeing firsthand God's <clears throat> acceptance of those who previously were considered unacceptable. In the middle of all this success and excitement, God directed Philip out into the desert for an unlikely appointment with that Ethiopian guy, <laughs> another foreigner who had been in Jerusalem. Philip went immediately. His effectiveness in sharing the gospel with this man placed a Christian in a significant position in a distant country and may well have had an effect on the entire continent. Philip ended up in Caesarea, where events allowed him to be Paul's host many years later. Paul, whose persecution had been instrumental in pushing Philip and others out to Jerusalem, had himself become an efficient, effective believer. Philip began the conversion of the Gentiles, which Paul continued across the entire Roman Empire. Whether or not you are a Christian, Philip's life presents a challenge. To those still outside the gospel, he is a reminder that the gospel is for you also. To those who have ex accepted Christ, he is a reminder that we are not free to disqualify, disqualify anyone from hearing about Jesus. How much like Philip would your neighbors say that you are? Now we're going to Cornelius. <clears throat> In the early days of Christianity, the, the early days of Christianity were exciting as God's spirit moved and people's lives were changed. Converts were pouring in from surprising backgrounds. Even the dreaded Saul became a Christian and the non-Jews were responding to the good news about Jesus. Among the first of these was the Roman captain Cornelius. Because of frequent outbreaks of violence, Roman soldiers had to be stationed throughout Israel to keep the peace. But most Romans, hated as conquerors, did not get along well in the nation. As an army officer, Cornelius was in a difficult position. He represented Rome, but his home was in Caesarea. During his years in Israel, he himself had been conquered by the God of Israel. He had a reputation as a godly man who put his faith into action, and he was respected by the Jews. Four significant aspects, aspects of Cornelius' character are noted in Acts. They were that he actively sought God, he revered God, 
He was generous in meeting people's needs, and, and he prayed. God told him to send for Peter, because Peter would give him more knowledge about God that he was already seeking to, to please. When Peter entered Cornelius' home, he broke a whole list of Jewish rules. Peter confessed he wasn't comfortable, but here was an eager audience, and he couldn't hold back his message. He had no sooner started sharing the gospel when God gave overwhelming approval by filling that Roman family with his Holy Spirit. Peter saw he had no choice but to baptize them and welcome them as equals in the growing Christian church. Another step had been taken in carrying the gospel to the whole world. Cornelius is a welcome example of God's willingness to use extraordinary means to reach those who desire to know him. He does not play favorites, and he does not hide from those who want to find him. God sent his son because he loves the whole world, and that includes Peter and you. Now, got, got to the bad guys here. Herod. Is that the way you say that? Herod? 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 Okay. Kind of an evil family. There are four of them. For good or for evil, families have a lasting and a powerful influence on their children. Traits and qualities are passed on to the next generation, even with the mistakes and sins of the parents being repeated by the children. Four ge generations of the Herod family are mentioned in the Bible. Each leader left his evil mark. Herod the Great, he murdered Bethlehem's baby boys. Herod Antipas was involved in Jesus' trial and John the Baptist's execution. Herod Agrippa I murdered the apostle James, and Herod Agrippa II was one of Paul's judges. Nice family. He had a Jewish grandmother of royal blood, which allowed, him, allowed people to accept, though grudgingly. As a youth, Agrippa I had been temporarily imprisoned by the emperor Tiberius. A second here, got tissue. Okay, as a youth, Agrippa I had been temporarily imprisoned by the Emperor Tiberius, but Rome now trusted him, and he got along well with the emperors Caligula and Claudius. The Christian, the Christian movement created an ex unexpected opportunity for Herod to, to gain new favor with the Jews. Gentiles began to be accepted into the church in large numbers. Many Jews had been tolerating this new movement as a sect with J Jerusalem, but its rapid growth alarmed them. Persecutions of Christians was revived, and even the, po the apostles were not spared. James was killed, and Peter was thrown into prison. But soon Herod made a fatal er error. During a visit to Caesarea, the people called him a god, and he accepted their praise. Herod was immediately struck with a painful disease, and he died within a week. Like his grandfather and his uncle before him and his son after him, Herod Agrippa I came close to the truth but missed it. Because of, religion, because of religion was important to him only as an aspect of politics. He had no reverence and no qualms about taking praise that only God should receive. His mistake was a common one. Whenever we become proud of our own abilities and accomplishments, not recognizing them as gifts from God, we repeat Herod's sin. And there's a lot of truth to that, for sure. And then we have Mark. Mistakes are effective teachers. Their consequences have a way of making les lessons painfully clear. But those who learn from their mistakes are wise. Mark was a good learner who just needed some time and some encouragement. Mark was eager to do the right thing, but he had trouble staying with the task. In his gospel, Mark mentions a young man, probably referring to himself, who fled in such fear during Jesus' arrest that he left his clothes behind. <laughs> this tendency to run showed up later when Paul and Barnabas took him, took him to Jerusalem. It was a decision Paul did not easily accept. In preparing for their sec... Uh, wait a minute, I left something out there. He's descending. He showed up. Anyway, when, when they were on their trip, he just up and left and went back to Jerusalem. 
And then um, that's when Paul did not accept that. In preparing for their second journey two years later, Barnabas again suggested Mark as a traveling companion, but Paul flatly refused. As a result, the team was divided, but Barnabas took Mark with him and Paul chose Silas. Barnabas was patient with Mark and the young man repaid his investment. Paul and Mark were later reunited and the older apostle became a close friend of the young disciple. Mark was a valuable companion to three early Christian leaders, Paul, Barnabas, and Peter. The material in Mark's gospel seemed to have come mostly from Peter. Mark's role as assistant allowed him to be an observer. He heard Peter's account of the years with Jesus over and over, and he was likely the first to put Jesus' life in writing. Barnabas played a key role in Mark's life. He stood beside the young man despite his failure, giving him patient encouragement. Mark challenges us to learn from our mistakes and appreciate the patience of others. Is there a Barnabas in your life you need to thank for encouraging you? I have several. I have several. Now we're on Barnabas. Barnabas, Barnabas. Every group needs an encourager because everyone needs encouragement at one time or another. However, the value of encouragement is often missed because it tends to be private rather than public. In fact, people most need encouragement when they feel alone. A man named Joseph was such an encourager that he earned the nickname Son of, um, of Encouragement, or Barnabas, from the Jewish Christians. Barnabas was drawn to people he could encourage, and he was a great help to those around him. It is a delight that wherever Barnabas encouraged Christians, non-Christians flocked to become believers. Barnabas's actions were crucial to the early church. In a way, we can thank him for the most of the New Testament. God used his relationship with Paul at one point and with Mark at another to keep these two men going when either might have failed. Barnabas did wonders with encouragement. When Paul arrived in Jerusalem for the first time following his conversion, the local Christians were reluctant, reluctant to welcome him. They thought his story was a trick to capture more Christians, but Barnabas was, proving, was proved willing to risk his life to meet with Paul and then convince the others that their former enemy was now a vibrant believer in Jesus. We can only wonder what might have happened to Paul without Barnabas. It was Barnabas who encouraged Mark to go with him and Paul to Antioch. Mark joined them on their first missionary journey, but decided during the trip to return home. Later, Barnabas wanted to invite Mark to join them for another journey, but Paul would not agree. As a result, the partners went separate ways, Barnabas with Mark and Paul with Silas. This actually doubled the missionary effort. Barnabas' patient encouragement was a huge boast, boost to the effectiveness of Mark's eventual ministry. Paul and Mark were later reunited in missionary efforts. As Barnabas' life shows, we are often presented with situations where there is someone who needs encouragement, but our tendency is to criticize instead. It may be important at times to point out at someone's shortcomings, but before we have the right to do this, we must build that person's trust through encouragement. Will you take the opportunity to encourage those whom you come with in contact with today? So that's all the guys I had from Acts, all the main characters, I would say. But I ran in the, my research, I ran across this little thing on the Rosetta Stone, which I thought was pretty interesting. I didn't know anything about it, and I thought I'd share it with you guys. Since Moses received an Egypt, a, the quality Egyptian education, <laughs> he would be able to read hieroglyphs. But over time, the ability to read hieroglyphs was lost. No one, no one could read them until the Rosetta Stone was discovered in 1799 by Napoleon's army near Rosetta on the Nile River. The stone records a degree of King uh, Potomia the Fifth, Potomi, in, in three languages. At the top of the stone are 14 lines of hieroglyphs, then 32 lines of an Egyptian script called de demonic, demotic and then 54 lines of Greek. The Greek was easy to read, but not the hieroglyphs. Eventually, it was recognized that the signs were used for sounds as well for, as for words, unearthing the key to deciphering hieroglyphs. 
This discovery gave birth to modern knowledge of ancient Egyptian language. The education Moses received in Egypt, including his knowledge of the hieroglyphics, was great preparation for the task God had in mind for him. God used him not only to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, but to write the first five books of the Bible. So, it's short again, but that's okay. <laughs> um, like I said, it, it just was really interesting for me to read actually some of the um, lives of those people in, in details and see what they'd gone through. And uh, Back in that day, the, the persecution of the Christians was just terrible. And uh, we just pray that it doesn't get to that point again. But if it does, we have Jesus on our side and right on our shoulder and we'll be, we'll be safe and we'll be sound. So, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this eager congregation to listen to me today, and thank you for the, the strength to get through it all. It was pretty pretty long reading. But anyway, I enjoyed it, and I just praise you, Lord. You are first in our lives, and you should be first in everyone's lives. Just be us, Lord, with us, Lord, as we go on our way this week. People that are traveling, keep them safe and just bring them back to us safe again too and have them enjoy their trips. We, we just pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you so much for listening to me. I appreciate it.